my name is Richie Birkenhead. Uh, I sing for Into Another. And, uh, we've just recently come out of uh, a very, very long hiatus, nearly 15 years. Or what is it that draws you guys back, actually, after all this time? Well, honestly, um, it was always sort of there. Drew, the drummer, and I um, wanted very badly at some point to bring the band back together. The, brand, the, the dissolution of the band came about after a long, very tense period uh, that involved a very unhappy relationship with our label, our record label, um, a very protracted, strange experience making a record that was ultimately never released and shelved by said label. And we sued the label. Um, our original bass player died very suddenly and unexpectedly. A lot of bad things happened. Um, he actually died post-band breakup. But, um, you know, we just sort of fell apart, and it was always sort of tragic, and Drew and I really longed to get the band back together. At some point, Peter sort of vanished into the ether. Peter was our guitar player, is our guitar player. Um, and he became virtually impossible to find, or actually impossible to find, and we, we tried very hard. We, you know, I even th uh, used some of those services online where you can find a person's, you know, you pay eight bucks and find a person's last known address and phone number. And, Basically, he moved to the middle of nowhere, and um, yeah, the, the reunion came about in, in a very unusual way as well. Um, Brian, who currently plays guitar in the band uh, along with Peter, and Reed, our bass player, sought us out, and um, Drew and I, after sort of informally auditioning guitarists, just in that we would come across guitarists sort of feel them out, see if they could play what Pete played, and we just couldn't find anyone. Um, these guys, sort of, to preempt any doubt, uh, went and made videos of themselves playing into another song, and with absolutely perfect execution and feel, and as if they were us. It was, it was eerie, you know, and we, Drew and I watched these video clips, and we were like, fuck, let's, let's do this, and tried again to find Pete. It was very, very difficult, and, you know, within hours of saying that we would play with these guys we were asked to play uh, a reunion show for our first label Revelation Records in Southern California and um, within hours of our agreeing to do that Peter surfaced and uh, I actually heard a cool story from a fan at a show um, the other night in New Jersey he said as soon as he heard the buzz about our playing the Revelation reunion show he went onto some blog and, and a lot of people were writing, no Peter Moses, no Peter Moses. And then he saw someone log in and write, yes, Peter Moses. And it was Peter Moses, in fact, writing this. And he said, uh, you know, people were very excited about that. So, yeah, I, I'm, of course, not ashamed of anything. And, I, and, I, and I, I'm actually very happy about the fact that this doesn't feel like a reunion ever. It, it really doesn't. It feels as if we were just sort of reanimated. We were like, you know... We were in a very long, very deep coma, and uh, it feels incredibly natural. The, the chemistry feels great. We've been writing and recording, and that feels just like it used to. In fact, a little bit better, to be honest. I think we're all more mature and uh, less inhibited creatively. And not that we were inhibited back then, but we were, we're even less inhibited now. Yeah. So it's, it's just flowing out of us. So. Very cool. Um, the last uh, record that you didn't put out took kind of a bit of a turn, so stylistically. I oh think. yeah, yeah. Um, was that the way you intended it to sound? Well, and we never finished. Was there? It's so, so the thing that got out there in bootleg form is is a is in fact an unfinished record. Uh, obviously, you know, we we would like guitars turned up louder, but yeah, we we definitely uh, intended it to be a radical departure. It's just what came out of us at the time. Um, we were there was a sort of a dark uh, cloud looming over us that was, was actually um, you know, making us create very prolifically, but it was stuff that was very different to what we had been creating. And uh, that record is, is very ethereal and dreamy and sad, and it's also got a lot of, uh, you know, naturally played analog drums that sound almost like, you know, electronic music drums in places, and uh, it's just what was... It's, pro it's it's this weird, complicated amalgam and cocktail of things we were listening to, things that were influencing us, 
lyrically, uh, you know, it's very sort of uh, ponderous and sad and dreamy because I, that's how I felt at the time. You know, it's, it was like our, uh, you know, sort of requiem or something. We were, the band was dying. <laughs> that's what came out of us. So, yeah, it was intentional that it, that, um, in that we started writing it, we knew it was very different, and we didn't care. And we were just like, let's just do this. Let's write these songs and put it out and see what happens. Sadly, it never came out, uh, except in blue Lake form, and we never really finished mixing it or mastering it or anything. So, Did you get a chance to get the rights to it back? No, because we had a very acrimonious split with our label, and um, we're, believe it or not, we're still working on getting it back. Um, but we're also not letting that, letting that hold us back from creating more music, so that's what we're doing currently. Do you see what you're doing now to be a continuation of that, or going back towards no, you know, no, the early what, stuff? That the, yeah, a it's not even. Yeah, and again, it's not <laughs> conscious at all. But what's coming out of us right now is, for the most part, big heavy guitars and big heavy drums, and uh, yeah, it's 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 loud, high energy uh, rock. You know, most of it not very fast or mid tempo and, and heavy. But there there are also a lot of other textures in, in there and there are whole songs that are not heavy as well but it's nothing like that unreleased record which had the working title Soul Control by the way that last record but um, it's, it's nothing like that whatsoever and it's, it's uh, if I had to compare it to any of our records um, I don't know as far as energy is concerned uh, maybe a couple of the songs on the EP on Creepy EP and, and some of the stuff on the, on the first album but again, very different from those two. Just, it's, it's a rocker. Where you feel this like crossover 90s crossover sound, this post rock or post hardcore sound, yeah. was kind of like, I don't know, invented or came about. Uh, you know. Uh, well, for me, I always thought, you know, I know people need to give names to genres and movements and things. I, I thought that the bands that sort of comprised that scene, if you will, you know, people who used to be in hardcore bands, I thought um, it was a very sort of disparate group of bands. I didn't think it was a same sounding. You know, it wasn't like rockabilly or metal you know what I mean it didn't it was uh, I, I, I don't think quicksand sounds like into another or orange 9mm or super touch or, you know what I mean um, but I you know I think the thing they all have in common is is there's definitely that that vein runs through that that aggressive energetic uh, angst laced sort of vein runs through all of those bands you know it's not it's not uh, power pop or feel good music for the most part. It, there's there's a lot of darkness, and um, so I, I I don't think of it as a, a genre stylistically, to be yeah. honest. But but it was a scene, sure, sure. Um, and I and I think it was a reaction to what came before in a way because you know hardcore, and I can only speak for myself, but I think I saw this in other people too. Um, you know when I first got into hardcore in around 1981, um, you know I, obviously I liked it because it was well, it. it it was the most underground thing there was. There was absolutely, you know, nothing that was more special or small or dangerous, you know, and, um, you know, within a very short time, things that I loved about it started to change. For instance, when, when I first started seeing bands like SSD Control and Minor Threat and I got really into the Straight Edge thing, Straight Edge was not a... Uh, this exclusionary elitist you know movement it was a bunch of people who didn't want to be like the fucking burnouts they went to high school with you know who, who cared more about life and wanted to experience it uh, and not just cloud their minds when they're 16 years old so but but it did factions of that straight edge movement evolved into very little exclusionary cliques and people cared much more about how they moshed and champions sweatshirts and you know and all the superficial style and not the substance of it so i became disillusioned i'm sure a lot of other people did we all still loved and revered hardcore you know um 
you know, whether it's quicksand or into another, all, all of us guys, and, and really into another, it was just two ex-hardcore guys and, and two guys who weren't in the hardcore scene. But Drew and I never lost our reverence and love for the hardcore scene, but we, we certainly didn't consider ourselves hardcore once we started into another. But, sure. you know, we had a lot of, surprisingly, and, and we felt very humbled and grateful about this, a lot of hardcore kids actually did come to our shows and that was fantastic but um yeah I, so I, I i think that that scene was just a reaction to hardcore maybe becoming a bit stagnant or a bit you know just just sort of plateauing and not being as uh, subversive and you know counterculture and special so. i almost felt that as different as all the bands sounded of course mm -hmm. you know and you know you could bring in um, only loving witness that list too you know sure I felt that these bands were kind of like the grunge of the East Coast. That's a way to look at it. But sure. like the real first gen grunge, not the second, third gen grunge. Right. You know? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Because the you unsung, know, you know, yeah. retainers. You know, look. I, I think that um, in any uh, in any cultural movement, you, you know, any any c cultural movement that's disruptive and subversive, even if it's only stylistically so, artistically so, um, you know, you want to recap. You always want to recapture that feeling of bucking the tide and going against the grain. And yeah, and I think what happened in the late '80s in Seattle and early '90s and stuff was also reactionary. You know, they were reacting to look how shitty music became in the '80s, and, and uh, you know, in these, and obviously those bands were heavily influenced by uh, the Stooges and the MC5 and, and also the Rolling Stones and the Ramones and the Sex Pistols and and they, they created an, uh, an amalgam of just straight up rock and roll and punk which was its own thing you know I don't mean to go off on a tangent but I have to say this because I was just talking about this with Drew today you know you bring up Seattle and New York there I think something very sad about the digital age is that the the possibility of a regional sound has vanished the possibility of a, of a regional anything even regional cuisine or anything has is vanishing or has vanished because the world's a global village this country is a grid of Starbucks and Barnes and Nobles um, their cities are you know the city I live in New York has lost a lot of its ethos it's not you know it's and you know it used to be that you know New York had the Velvet Underground, and then later the Ramones, and, and, and things that came out of New York had that New York grit and the New York sound, and you know, uh, like I mentioned, the MC5 and the Stooges sounded like Detroit. They just sounded like Detroit, you know what I mean? It just, uh, the Beach Boys and the Doors sound like LA, or whatever it is. Like, the regional music is disappearing, and I think it's really tragic. <laughs> For me to talk about you know, real issues and things that affect people, uh -huh. people's uh, struggles, uh -huh. and like I guess their perspective on the world today. You mean sociologically happening to people or happening to the demographically? Demographically, well, uh, I mean that's a I could go on and on and waste a lot of uh, hard drive space, but I mean in a nutshell, the things that concern me the most are the well, the overall desensitization of people, particularly young people, to things like violence and uh, a general uh, loss of empathy and compassion and respect for previous generations, a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not saying, I don't mean to make sweeping generalizations because I, I constantly meet young, forward thinking, amazing kids, you know, smart and sensitive and great and, and, and everything. But I, I think that, you know, we're so so much more so than ever, we're bombarded with stimuli. Everybody wants instant gratification. There's, there's no more subtlety or irony in art or literature. And again, I'm speaking in hyperbole. I mean that for the most part. And, uh, you know, everybody's got to, nobody wants to sit and ponder a thought and draw a conclusion and then share it 
in an essay. They want to just fart it out in a fucking 140 character tweet. And I just think that, you know, there are so many bad... Uh, there are great things about the digital age and about the proliferation of, you know, information and the fact that I, that I don't have to go to a library and go like this through cards to find, like, the good books about a subject I'm interested in. You know, I guess those things are great. But, you know, it, it also sucks that people don't have to do that because they there's no more leg work there's no you know it, it makes one lose uh, a degree of appreciation for like seeking things out on your own forming your own opinions you know gleaning these little gems of knowledge and, and wisdom um, through that journey and that search uh, you know I, so I I, I feel as if uh, we have become sort of a numbed uh, nation. Um, you know, we're just constantly, 24 hours a day, bombarded with horrible news and video games and bullshit and insipid famous people who are famous for absolutely nothing and who are grossly materialistic and awful and narcissistic. <laughs> <laughs> but again, there are lots of great people too. How do you overcome whichever struggles you've gone through over the years? I think it's maybe a little bit of wisdom for people okay. watching. But you know, thankfully, I, I'm I'm past a lot of that. You know, I, I actually had a, a very tumultuous childhood and and was wounded very deeply emotionally and uh, psychologically, mentally, um, and even physically and. Uh, for me, um, the greatest catharsis and the, the greatest healing catalyst was uh, writing lyrics and composing music and, uh, and going on stage for an hour and ten minutes and screaming my head off. Uh, you know, I think everyone finds their own catharsis. Uh, that did it for me more so than anything. And, and these days, what does it for me more than anything is... There's my children. I have two children, and uh, you know, that's where I focus everything. And I and I'm very very conscious of uh, you know always thinking about what type of a world we're leaving them, and what you know, and how to prepare them for whatever this nation of ours and this world of ours is turning out. You know, um, so. All I can say is through, through, through the years that really, uh, where I did a lot of healing and uh, facing and overcoming struggles, um, being creative did it, you know, the, the, the unhappiest times for me were the times where I became lazy or, uh, you know, just sort of a apathetic. And I, so I would, I would definitely encourage people to, you know, first of all, stay very much aware of what's going on in the world and, and you know, what's going on socially politically because you know that also helps too it helps you become less self-centered for sure you know because it's really easy if you if you are struggling like you said a lot of people in this scene you know one thing we the great majority of us has in common is you know there was some dark shit in our past and uh you know turning it all inward and and becoming just a you know blob of self-pity is the worst thing you can do and so um what I tried to do creatively was just be, just employ total candor, even if I was embarrassed about things I was writing about, and you know, not feel sorry for myself with what I was writing, but but definitely express a lot of anger, frustration, you know, and sometimes utter despair and hopelessness. And if I would puke out a bunch of hopelessness in the form of lyrics, I'd start to feel a little more hopeful. So you know, um, but, and again, that's me. Some people don't have a creative outlet and so they find it elsewhere you know I, you know I would just say if, if there's even a tiny kernel of some passion in you about anything you know if it's if it's uh, architecture or if it's you know uh, building soup kitchens wherever you can and like you know in the areas where the disenfranchised people in your city live whatever it is I would say just become obsessed with it and just you know from the moment you wake up to 
And then you go to sleep, just do it. Just fucking, even if you, you're really shitty at it at first. So. Those are wise words to offer people. I don't, yeah, I don't know if there was. It's just, um, yeah, I can only speak from my own experience. And, and again, when I, when I didn't do that and I became complacent, I became very depressed. So <laughs> just mm. keep doing it. Cool. Are there any other issues that concern you that, that, that you want to maybe tell people to keep their eyes out for? Oh, yeah, I mean, there are so many. I mean, yeah. Things that make me the most mad are uh, the fact that although I live in a country I, I consider to be a, a, a really wonderful country with a wonderful constitution, it disgusts me and embarrasses me that about a third of the people who hold office in this country don't even believe in evolution. Or that, you know, the journalists in our country are afraid to tell people who say that climate change doesn't exist as a result of what we do that they're completely fucking insane because the entire global scientific community is basically unanimous and you know they're just listening to some fucking paid off lobbyists who are like well maybe it's not us you know so I, there, there are things about this country that really make me sick you know the fact that you can't run for office you can't run for the office of the president unless you spend hundreds of millions of dollars I mean, that's fucking insane like we, we have salary caps in pro sports let's have a fucking campaign fund cap you know what i mean and let's let's uh let's stop let's also stop being so fucking politically correct and that we have to portray every story symmetrically they're not symmetrical you know what i mean like you don't have to put on kid gloves and treat the people who don't believe in evolution as if they're not fucking morons because they are because you know, Darwin already sorted it out with the origin of species a long fucking time ago. And, you know, the fact that, you know, uh, Bashir was chastised for saying a few words about Sarah Palin. Are you fucking kidding me? You know what I mean? Like, so, yeah, there's a lot that pisses me off. And there's a lot about this country that pisses me off. But I'm also not one of those people who hates this country. In fact, I love this country very much. I just, you know, we used to be the country... We were the, we're the country that produced... Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, Dorothy Parker, Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, you know, the Beach Boys, the Doors, uh, Jasper Johns, Grandma Moses, whatever, you know what I mean? And now we're the country that's obsessed with Kim Kardashian. So, the, you know, I'm really hoping the pendulum swings back and, uh, you know, we, we're not just a, a nation that reads Us Weekly and, and cares about shit that isn't important.